covert DNA collection, human genetic modification, biohacking, gene editing, bioweaponry. It's all going on around us every day, but most of us know nothing about this shadowy world of genetics. From myself, Mark L. Watson. This is Double Helix. It's the 19th of January, 2021. Christmas in the US has been marred by constant political fighting between the outgoing Trump administration and, seemingly, everyone else. The results of the presidential election have been counted and recounted, contested and recontested. Regardless of whether everyone likes it or not, and there are a small group who absolutely don't, it's without question nor valid appeal that in less than 24 hours, President number 45 will be packed and moved on, and President number 46 will have taken office. The few weeks leading up to Trump's eventual begrudged departure from the big house have been as event-filled, divisive, and dramatic as the rest of his tenure at the top of the government. Two weeks earlier, a mob had stormed their way through the security blockade and into the Capitol building, ransacking in protest of the election result, thumping the foundations of American democracy into question. Now whether incited by the head man or not, it proved to be that little bit of powdered sugar on top of the cherry, on top of the icing, on top of the cake when it came to Trump's administration. But by Tuesday the 19th of January, there was largely nobody at work inside the White House. Staff from the departing administration were sitting around, drinking coffee, cleaning out the very last corners of their desks and cabinets, and wasting time until the end of the day. Indeed, most weren't there at all. But the building was alive with action regardless. The new team was moving in. Huge ships full of crew on very different voyages passing through each other in the twinkling pink light of morning. One crew had been at sea for four long years, riding the waves and standing through the cold nights. They were battered. They'd lost many of their own to the sea along the way, and those still standing on deck were glad to see the shore. The other crew were full of excitement, bags packed, larders stocked, looking out to the horizon and imagining what may be out there, what lay before them on their voyage. Administration teams were working overtime to ensure the smooth transition and preparing for the grand inauguration of Joe Biden the following day. No real official business was on the cards. It was the last day of school. But in the press room, a sharp-suited Mike Pompeo had other ideas. He'd been director of the CIA for just over a year, elected to office by the president in January 2017. Little more than a year later, he was moved again at the behest of Trump, getting himself an office in the White House as the US Secretary of State. 19th of January 2021 was his last day on the job, and he was going to use it. He stood to the microphone, the blue wall and perfectly folded flags behind him and publicly declared, on behalf of the USA, that China was committing genocide and crimes against humanity. 
It was a huge moment, overshadowed in the following days by the inauguration of a new president and the beginning of a new chapter. But his words weren't lost. Genocide. It was about as strong as an accusation can get. Crimes against humanity. His words. The relations between the two countries have been strained even in their best moments, and during the Trump administration, Trump himself would be the first to admit that they were struggling. Indeed, it seems at times that that was exactly what Trump was aiming for. But one of the final acts of his administration was to publicly call them out for their treatment of the Uyghur Muslim population that reside within mainland China. The reports had been coming in slowly for years, and there's far too much to go into here. Pompeo went on to list a few of the crimes committed by the People's Republic of China, acting under the lead of President Xi Jinping's Chinese Communist Party, or the CCP. The, quote, arbitrary imprisonment, again his words, quote, of more than a million civilians. In the months since, the horrific reports of the treatment of the Uyghur Muslim population have come more to light. Chinese whistleblowers have exposed some details. The occasional Western reporter has made it inside the heavily guarded province of Xinjiang, the location of the atrocities, indeed the largest province in the whole of China. Forced sterilisation. Forced labour. Tortures of those who were detained and the imposition of draconian restrictions of freedom of religion or belief, of freedom of expression and freedom of movement. All his words. Crimes dating back at least four years to 2017 and likely many more, and still ongoing to this day. More crucially, ongoing at an increasing rate. Pompeo dropped the mic. He'd thrown the grenade and run. A few hours later, he was no longer Secretary of State. The Biden team moved in and, for some time at least, offered no more information, no further opinion, no official response to Mike Pompeo's allegations. There wasn't much about the Trump administration that garnered my personal approval, and I appreciate we all differ in political allegiance and standing, but to me, Mike Pompeo was spot on. It was genocide. They were crimes against humanity. But that wording's not completely accurate. It is still genocide. And they are, in their thousands, still crimes against humanity. Even now, today, it continues. The persecution of millions. China, of course, merely denied it all. Re-education, they call it. To date, millions have been imprisoned and detained in vast camps, most with no release date in sight. China strongly refutes all claims of torture, sterilisation and forced labour, and shrugged the entire assault off as American nonsense. But the story was out, and the world was listening. Since then, countries around the world have stood by the accusations, adding to the rhetoric their own. Other than those nations whose political allegiance or military inferiority forces them to stand next to the Red Dragon in fear of pointing swords its way, there's near global condemnation for the atrocities being committed there on the Uyghur population, and indeed on many others. In 2021, the Newslines Institute for Strategy and Policy, a US-based non-partisan think tank, issued a 25,000-word report in which it states that China is breaking, quote, every article in the Geneva Convention. The Chinese foreign minister said the accusation, quote, could not be more preposterous, 
and that it is a, quote, rumour fabricated with ulterior motives and a total lie. In 2020, a case was brought before the International Criminal Court, the ICC, at The Hague. Its goal was to charge the People's Republic of China with its crimes. The ICC is the first and to date only international court. It was set up to prosecute this exact thing on an international stage. But it found that the crimes in China were committed by Chinese nationals and within the boundaries of the nation of China. So it isn't an international crime and, therefore, the case was dropped. There's mounting pressure to change the ICC's jurisdiction to allow it more power to take on cases such as the Uyghur genocide, but until that happens, and it likely won't, the ICC and the nations of the world are largely helpless to stop them. And therein lies the crux of all this, and the crux of the entire story you're about to hear from me too. China enjoys the autonomy it's afforded itself. It's careful not to overstep the international legal restrictions set out by the UN or others. It pushes its own luck as far as it pleases, stopping just close enough to the line to avoid major trouble. It does what it wants, providing it has the blessing of the mighty CCP and the all-powerful President Xi. It only allows the international audience to see what it chooses, and it bows to no one. Should anyone inside the country rise up, protest too effectively, spread word against the regime too far or too loudly. It offers various forms of repression. It knows its own power. It knows it's a force to be reckoned with militarily, and that any show of force against it can be largely matched. Basically, China does what it wishes. The CCP have made it abundantly clear that they have no time, no tolerance for political uprising and competition. China leads the world in many accomplishments, but one it's seemingly not shouting so loudly about is that of state political repression. When it comes to silencing its critics and shutting down protests, China rules the roost. Since the 1989 Tiananmen Square incident, where China took a huge stand against the pro-democratic protest movement, it's imprisoned a staggering number of political dissidents and those willing to speak out against the great regime. The CCP has ruled China under one guise or another since 1949, and it's now referred to as simply the party within the borders of its own nation. It's a dictatorship to rival history's greatest, and its hands are as stained with blood as any other. You simply do not go up against them. There are many who have not lived to tell the tale. Though, whilst the memory of these people, these trailblazers of democratic hope, futile in their attempts to change the path of the old dragon, while their memory should be honoured and kept. This is not directly their story. I encourage you to look for their names. Lu Xiaobo, a Nobel Peace Prize winner detained and eventually killed for political dissent. Liu Ping, a civil rights activist jailed in 2014 for picking quarrels and provoking trouble. That's their official line, the actual name of the offence under Article 293 of the Criminal Code. There's Gulmira Imin, jailed for life for taking part in what was deemed a, quote, unlawful demonstration. Hu Wengshu Yu, a lawyer who sued the state over its atrocious air pollution records, also arrested and charged in 2018. Each of them has their story, and each of them deserves to have that story heard, as do the millions of others, as do the millions of Uyghur Muslims who are currently being imprisoned and detained and tortured to this very day. But it's not the political repression and oppression that brings me here. It's deeper than that, often darker. It runs beneath the surface in a place where it's hard to see, but I assure you, it's there. It's what happens to those activists and lawyers and students and politicians who stand against the party. It's another national problem, and one you won't get much of an admission to from those in the know. And it's far from just a Chinese problem, either. It's an accusation of malpractice and corruption that ripples around the globe, 
and reaches deep into the lives of many of us, many of you. You, yourself listening, may have already been a part of this web and simply just not known it. In 2017, some time before the general public was aware of the level of persecution and genocide facing the Uyghurs in mainland China, a report dropped from Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is an international organisation based in New York, just a few blocks down from Bryant Park in Midtown, but with a reach across the entire globe. They were founded in 1978 under the name Helsinki Watch, tasked initially solely with monitoring the Soviet Union's adherence to the Helsinki Accords, the document signed at the end of the Cold War, aimed at bringing better relations between the East and the West. They adopted the approach of calling out those not sticking to the agreement, naming and shaming any government at fault, and playing an integral part in the democratic transformations made in the region throughout the 1980s. Now with a global reach, and a new name. They conduct research and advocacy on human rights abuses by international governments, private companies, policy makers and even individual human rights abusers. In 1997, they shared the Nobel Peace Prize for their work on banning landmines. The Human Rights Watch China director is the incredible Sophie Richardson, who has overseen the research and advocacy of the People's Republic of China since 2006. It was her report that dropped like the bomb back in 2017. China's police are collecting DNA from individuals for a nationally searchable database without oversight, transparency or privacy protections, the report states. Collecting DNA from convicted criminals is fairly common practice around the world, and in my opinion, it's a perfectly smart practice at that. We'll touch on this a little more later. But this report went further. The Chinese DNA collection wasn't just for convicted criminals. It wasn't even for suspected criminals. They were routinely, systematically, forcefully even, taking DNA and blood samples from ordinary citizens. There was, and there still is, a greater focus on those individuals or groups who the CCP have already kept under closer surveillance. So, the aforementioned Uyghur Muslim population, other migrants, political dissidents, and anybody previously outspoken against the government. And also, those with even the slightest air of suspicion about their work or their heritage. Suspicion, of course, as viewed through the red-tinted glasses of the big communist dragon. Because the police in China wield so much great power, acting as the enforcers of the state at the CCP's whims, and also, as Human Rights Watch say, as there are no actionable privacy rights in China, people have little option but to allow the process to happen. The collection of the organic data, the blueprint of each individual, the biological fingerprint of every living thing, is being harvested in increasingly off-hand ways, and the reason behind it is as malevolent too. The Chinese government has been compiling its DNA database since the early 2000s, and is open about its existence. It proudly claims to be the biggest of its kind in the world, and it almost certainly is, especially given the population size. At the time of Sophie Richardson's report in 2017, it claimed to hold on file the genetic blueprint of over 40 million individuals, though the figure was thought to be significantly higher even then. That was five years ago, and the genocide, as Mike Pompeo said, has been accelerating ever faster in the years since. The true figure can really only be guessed at, but it's thought to be over a fifth of the Chinese population. That's 280 million people. As Sophie Richardson wrote, China is moving its Orwellian system to the next level. Their aim is to have collected and sequenced enough individuals' DNA profiles that they effectively have a genetic map of all individuals. Think, you don't need to collect 
every single person's DNA to get the big picture. If they have your brothers, your fathers, your sons, then they can piece together a rough estimate of your own. Reports from some of those individuals, those ordinary citizens, have since published details of their stories onto social media, though the policing of even this is tightly controlled by the CCP. Some of the biggest global platforms don't even have a presence in China. They describe officers coming to their homes, to their workplaces, and more concerningly into schools, to routinely collect blood and DNA samples for storage. For, quote, solving crimes, the CCP says. They offer no more explanation than that, and nobody can force them to. There's no forewarning, no booked appointments, and no sign of a warrant or permit anywhere. But God forbid you should say no. That's not really an option. You give the sample without a fuss, or you can climb into the back of the van in handcuffs and kiss goodbye to your freedoms. The government also requires a DNA sample be taken, voluntarily or otherwise, when any individual applies for a government ID card or a residency permit or a passport. Any foreign citizen moving to China will be submitting their DNA or they won't be going there, not legally anyway. The Human Rights Watch report cites one account which was posted online in June 2016, where the individual claims to have been stopped at a roadblock and forced to submit a sample completely against their will. In Shandong province in 2006, the story leaked to a local news outlet that over 5,000 male and only male will come to that later too. Students of a college had been forced to submit a DNA sample to the authorities. Most were extremely uncomfortable with it. Many protested. But you don't protest against the will of Xi Jinping. That's not how dictatorships work. I managed to catch up with Sophie Richardson from Human Rights Watch. She's over in DC and I caught her early before breakfast one morning, just a few days before she headed off on an extended break. I'm Sophie Richardson. I'm Human Rights Watch's China director. I put it to Sophie that Whilst this story had been unfolding for quite a long time, certainly before it reached public awareness, Human Rights Watch and indeed Sophie herself had been tracking developments, especially within China. I wanted to know what it was that first triggered that awareness, what it was that first dropped the story onto Sophie's desk. Well, first, all credit here to my brilliant colleague, Maya Wang, uh, who has who has led on all of this work for several years now. And what we had started to notice was the Chinese government's increasing use of different forms of technology, uh, which was, I and mean, that in and of itself was, was hardly headline news. For us as a human rights organization, what we started to see more clearly soon, within the first couple of years after Xi Jinping came to power, was the way the authorities were using technology, not just to surveil and limit free speech, but to track individuals. Uh, you know, again, from our perspective, this was often about human rights defenders across China who were, uh, you know, flagged and prevented from traveling from one place to another to keep uh, a human rights lawyer, for example, from representing a client in another province. It was a very effective tool for the authorities to use. But as we started to look more at these different kinds of technology, what was very clear was that the, the, surve- the domestic surveillance apparatus, mostly the, the, the police, had just gone to town with everything from voice recognition software to you know, uh, uh, starting to build massive databases. Uh, people were starting to talk about things like the social credit system, uh, you know, which is another way of the authorities hoovering up massive amounts of data for somewhat unclear purposes. And you know, then and now our concern was about a lack of enforceable privacy rights and that the authorities' uses of these technologies rarely met uh, the, the test of being necessary, legitimate, and proportionate. Uh, you know, the, and we can, we can go into the details of, of human rights law if you want. Uh, it might be lethally dull. 
Uh, but it was in the both in the course of that work, but also at the same time, what was happening across the Uyghur region was was of you know was of exponentially greater concern 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. Uh, and there was a moment when those two problems, the intersection between those two problems became very clear to us. Some of the people we had been interviewing about what was happening uh, across the Uyghur region were talking about the technology that had been used either after they had been detained or seemingly specifically to detain them. Um, and that became, and that was sort of roughly similar to different kinds of technologies we were tracking the use of in other parts of the country. And we ultimately wrote about reverse engineering a police app. But it was in the course of starting to look more specifically at the Chinese government's uses of surveillance technologies in, uh, in Xinjiang that we started to find things like procurement documents, which are, I think, fairly strong expressions of, of you know, how a state is trying to implement policies, what it buys, from whom it buys it, you know, what the intent of, of that equipment is. And obviously, it has to be matched up with other kinds of official documents or reporting to show how a particular technology is being used. But that was how we first came to start looking at uh, the abusive collection of DNA in the Uyghur region. We had already started writing about broader Chinese government efforts uh, to build a national DNA database particularly of men and boys, although our friends at the um, Australian Strategic Policy Institute had started writing about that in about 2013 or 2014. Um, but it was, pretty, it was pretty clear quickly how broadly authorities intended to deploy this technology. What's less clear is what exactly they intend to do with these oceans and oceans and oceans of data. But as we all know, in this day and age, data is power. And when you don't have the ability both to say no to a state collecting it from you or to control or challenge how a state is using it, you know, that, that leaves people in an already you know, rights-free environment that much worse off. Xinjiang, the province where the Uyghur genocide is mostly taking place, is, of course, at the forefront of this huge drive to collect and collate the DNA of its people. And crucially, they're doing more than simply storing the samples in a big library. In 2016, a Human Rights Watch investigation found that the Xinjiang Regional Police Bureau ordered 12 DNA sequences. 30 polymerase chain reaction amplifiers and a thousand batches of genotyping kits. We can get into what all that means a little later, but it's fairly safe to say that there's considerable work going on at a regional and national level to map out the genomes of the people who live there. Yeah, I mean, if I had to count how many of our reports have titles with things like, of quotes like, we have no liberty to refuse, or we can't opt out, or, you know, we have no power, it would be, it would be, it would be a long list. But it's, it's funny that you should mention that. You know, we, we obviously work on a lot of different topics that are, um, you know, that, that, that describe how horrific human behavior towards one another can be. I think this particular work is viscerally horrifying when, for example, you read about people whose children had blood samples drawn at school and they can't find out why. <laughs> or when you, I think, come to stop and when when you stop and think about what the second most powerful government in the world uh, which has a very strong expectation of impunity intends to do with that data and and i say that partly you know thinking back 10 years ago uh, if you had asked us whether we thought the chinese government was going to commit crimes against humanity and do so in the ways that it has or that xi jinping had an idea of profoundly transforming how individuals across the country behave or imposing this idea of a loyal citizen. We certainly could have said to you, you know, the, the signs are not fantastic. It was 
I think not conceivable <laughs> what we what we what we see now and I think part of our work is about explaining trying to explain to a, a broader audience what the consequences are for people inside and outside the country I mean when you when you when we reverse engineered that police app in 2019 2019 uh, you know, we did that because we wanted we wanted to understand what behavior the authorities had decided was problematic. Yeah. You know, which which in a functional democracy we would know that by reading laws, right? <laughs> there would be a public debate about, you know, whether X and such should be criminal. And when we came to unpack that source code and realize the extent to which authorities were effectively criminalizing some of the most mundane human activity, uh, but but the hostility reflected in that, right? The state the state algorithm of hostility towards Islam, towards uh, uh, people having certain kinds of independent activities, right? It, it was it's very chilling to see that not just play out, but to see the steps along the way, right? To watch somebody build that machine. You know, and to understand how it affects everybody from older people to children is pretty horrifying. So a little more of the backstory here, a little more from behind the curtain. What is it? that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to achieve with this huge sweep of DNA collection. As I said earlier, many nations, including the US and UK, collect the DNA of known or suspected criminals. There have been numerous court cases and numerous pieces of legislation to govern the best practice around this and to protect the civil rights and the civil liberties of the people. Even as a convicted criminal, you still have human rights and they should still be protected. But China waives its human rights for a greater goal. You see, it has a plan. So what is it doing aside from the goal of improving the ability of the police to solve crimes? And it's reasonable to say that that is still part of the reason for its actions. It does want a tighter grip of its people. It does want to have the ability to prosecute individuals swifter than before, to keep a better handle on dissidents and criminals alike. Whether breaching the International Code of Conduct for Human Rights or not, you can at least understand the logic behind that line of thinking. You don't have to agree with it, but you're likely not listening to this podcast from the point of view of a communist dictatorship. There's also the continued persecution of many of its own people, based on their heritage from one of the many disparate groups within China, the Uyghurs, the long-standing conflict and abuse of the Tibetan people, the disputes over Hong Kong and the existing one over Taiwan. Many of these people will have traces of their history inside their DNA. It's possible, theoretically, to ascertain whether or not someone comes from a minority population based on their genetic code. It's not always accurate, and that is a huge issue, but it's often one simply glazed over by the authorities. You have Uyghur blood? Then into the re-education camp with you. But China is also using these vast banks of genetic sequences for its own research purposes. And that's where the Geneva Convention is really sitting up to listen. And this is where the rabbit hole really starts. If the rest of what I've previously told you sounds like you're already in the deep end, then you're going to have to be ready to swim much harder. In 1987, US President Ronald Reagan submitted his budget proposition to Congress, including a $16 million allowance for a new project. It would swiftly pass through both houses and be given a timeline which should run and operate for 15 years. It was the collective idea of a few brilliantly minded individuals, and it would go on to be named the Human Genome Project. Its goal was to use the new technologies of gene mapping and DNA sequencing to fully map out the entire human genome, creating a genetic linkage map. 
It was officially launched in 1990 and concluded and declared complete in April 2003, though only around 85% of the full genome had been mapped by that point. The work continued under various other groups and the level of complete genome was finally achieved in 2021 with only 0.3% still unmapped due to various other issues. It was in January of 2022 that that last little bit was finished and the human genome completely mapped out. Now, on the back of this, or at least on the back of the official closure of the project in 2003, came new ventures. There was an international effort to produce a detailed catalogue of all the variations of the human genome called the Thousand Genomes Project. There was the Thousand Plant Genome Project, the Thousand Rare Diseases Project. There were similar ones for microbes, extreme environments, and even for big cats. All was set out to take as much genetic data as possible and to construct the best and most comprehensive data set to understand DNA and the genome. All of these projects were at least participating in and often run by the Chinese under the operation of a company called BGI. The Beijing Genomics Institute, which now actually owns so many subsidiaries that they become the BGTI Group, was founded in 1999 specifically to ask as China's representative in the Human Genome Project. They were always an independent company, at least on paper, but independence is a rare thing in China. Independence is only granted by the government, not a thing that can be self-proclaimed. And what started out as an independent research company soon became one of the leading genomics institutes on the planet, with ties that run to the very centre of the Chinese Communist Party and indeed the military. Now what goes on there has been the stuff of legends. And frankly, the stuff of nightmares. Gene editing, human enhancement, attempts to bring back prehistoric animals, genetic surveillance on an astronomical level, Orwellian, as Sophie Richardson said. And where is the data for all this research coming from? Well, from you. Double Helix was written and produced by myself, Mark Watson. Sound design is produced with credit to Looper Man and Pixabay. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the show, and to all my guests who kindly gave up time from their busy schedules to speak with us. And I'd like to thank you, too, the listener. Without your support, none of this would be possible. You can find more content and follow my work at marklwatson.co.uk or by searching anywhere online. Thank you for listening, and please go and dig deeper on everything that has been discussed in this show. There is so much more yet to uncover.